Do you hear that? Listen, listen, I'll do it again. You hear that too, right? Like I'm not just crazy. This room is really poorly treated for sound recording. And that sound you're hearing, I mean, outside of the initial claps, is reverb. So today, I'm going to show you how you can turn all of your scrap wood into some functional wall art that will dramatically reduce the amount of reverb you get in a room like this. Sound like fun? All right, cool, let's head to the shop. If you're anything like me, you probably have somewhere like this. This is the corner of the shop where I keep all of the excess materials at the end of the build. And in addition to that, I also have this, these racks up here that are also filled with excess materials. And if that wasn't enough, I also have these, these little storage bins filled with very small cutoffs. So as you can see, I've got a lot of excess scraps around the shop. So before I even think about buying any wood for this build, I'm gonna start cutting up all of these excess pieces. Not only am I gonna create something fun for my home, but I'm also gonna clean up the shop while I'm at it. Two birds, one stone. Before we start cutting up this wood though, I should let you know about the sponsors of today's video. That's right, we got two sponsors for this build. So the first one is going to be Minwax. I'm gonna be using one of their finishes to seal and protect this wood long-term. I've been using Minwax stuff for years, so I'm really excited to have them on board on this build. And then the second one is going to be Purdy Brushes. Now, I've been using Purdy Brushes in the construction world for like a decade now. I regard them as the best brushes you can get. So when it comes time to apply that Minwax finish, I will be using a Purdy brush to apply them. All right. Let's gather up this wood and see what we're working with. There's so many fun memories here. Like take this piece, for example. This is an off cut from my desk build. These pieces of red oak here are left over from the Shoshugi Bond desk. These pieces of maple here, I'm pretty sure are left over from my pixelated coffee table. It's just nice that all these little pieces, all these little parts of old projects are going to get to live on a new life in a new build. Anyways, that's of enough of a trip down memory lane. Let's get started on some sound diffusion panels. First step of this build is probably gonna be the most time consuming step. What I have to do is take each of the individual pieces of wood you see here in front of me and cut them down to a nice uniform three quarter inches by three quarter inches. I'm probably gonna spend the next two or three hours here on the table saw doing that, which I'm really not looking forward to, but don't worry, in the edit, I'll make it look nice, snappy, and fun. If you've never seen a wood sound diffuser before, don't worry, they're pretty rare outside of recording studios, but they're basically just a grid of wood blocks set at different heights. So to start this build, I began by ripping all of my scrap wood into long square wooden rods. And right off the bat, yes, I am aware that I look ridiculous wearing that big face shield, but I couldn't find my normal safety glasses anywhere. And everybody knows if you're gonna make a YouTube video and do something even slightly unsafe, everyone's gonna give you grief in the comments. So face shield, it was. Okay, so that took a little bit longer than I thought, but this big pile of wood here should be enough to get the job done. And just in case it's not, I have a couple pieces of oak back there cut in reserve, but I wanted to kind of split it up evenly between the different colors of wood so that we can have a nice even gradient between our pieces. And you know what my biggest disappointment about this is? I actually thought that this was gonna eliminate some of the clutter here in the shop, but as you can see, these uh, bins here might actually be more full than when we originally started. Nonetheless, the show must go on. So as you can see on a lot of these pieces, there's some burn marks left over from the table saw. Honestly, I think it's time for a new table saw blade. So I'm gonna run these guys through the drum sander and sand that off. Ah, another video means another chance to talk about just how much I love my drum sand. Being able to run big batches like this through the sander was a huge time save. I couldn't imagine trying to do this with a palm sander or even worse by hand. Ugh. All it took was a few passes of 80 grit to remove the majority of the burn marks. However, since the sander removes a bit of material on each pass, I had to make sure that I was sanding two adjacent faces on each piece in order to keep them all perfectly square. This will be an important detail later in the build. You'll see. Next, it was time to start cutting all of my wooden rods into smaller wooden blocks that would form the body of my sound diffuser. When I first started, I had grand ambitions about being super organized and cutting all my blocks to specific sizes. So I marked out some nice round numbers and tape on the miter soft vents. But to be perfectly honest, after a few minutes, I was basically just chopping pieces for random lengths and then throwing them in a big pile. 
By the time I was done, I had cut over 1,000 individual blocks, all of which were somewhere between a half inch long and four inches long. Okay, I think that's enough blocks. Now, before we start arranging these into any sort of pattern, let's cut the plywood sheets that we're gonna use as a backer board for the Santa Fusion kit. I've heard it said that all great art demands an equally great canvas, so I figured that for my janky little art project, some 5 8 rough plywood would make for a very fitting canvas. I ripped two 12 inch wide pieces out of a full sheet, and then cross cut each one into three pieces on the miter saw. I set the first three aside as my backer boards, and the other three pieces I ripped in half at a 45 degree angle so that I could use them as big French cleats to eventually mount the panels in my office. As a final piece of prep, in order to keep the thousands of wood blocks I was about to glue down organized, I marked out the horizontal and vertical centers of each backer board. And in order to make sure that the first couple of rows went imperfectly straight, I clamped some square tube steel in place to act as a physical guide. All right, so we are almost ready to start gluing these blocks in place. I have my glue here. I have some rapid setting CA glue, and then I also have some regular wood carpenters glue. I'm not sure which I'm gonna like more, so I'm gonna try both out. Before I get started on that though, there's one thing I wanna talk about. This is actually something that I've been thinking about quite a bit lately. I'm under a lot of pressure to make these videos as snappy and as watchable as possible. So I often end up condensing things into very short video clips. Something that takes three hours to do in real life often becomes a small three second video clip. And I worry that that creates an unrealistic expectation of how long these projects take to do. So what I'd like to do today is include a little timer in the corner of the screen that shows in actual time how long this has taken me. And I suspect it's gonna take a while. You'll see behind me here, I have my laptop set up and that's because I'm gonna be watching some movies while I do this. Yeah, I think this is gonna take five, six, maybe even seven hours to do. So I just wanted to inject a little bit of realism back into these videos. With that being said, let's get to work. And so it began. It was finally time to start piecing together my panels and boy, did I have my work cut out for me. Remember, we're talking about over a thousand individual pieces here. Let's start by talking about the pattern that I was going for. I wanted this diffuser to look like a big undulating wave. So I started in the middle of the panel with my tallest pieces and then worked my way outwards from there, slowly tapering to two troughs on either side and then finally rising again towards the outside edges. Well, I was right. It's taken me a long time to do this, but the good news is I am absolutely crushing some old episodes of Star Trek. This is fun. Let's keep going. Other than that, I just tried to maximize the variation between individual blocks and avoid having two similarly sized blocks directly next to each other. My theory was that this would look the best and it would also help with performance. Many acoustic sound traps work by absorbing sound waves with soft materials like foam. Wood sound diffusers, on the other hand, function by breaking up sound waves and then reflecting them back in all sorts of different directions. So I figured that the more variation I had between individual blocks, the more the panels as a whole would be able to break up sound waves. Okay, so it's the start of day two. I just counted and so far I've done 420 blocks and I've probably got about another 420 to go. I got my iced coffee here so I have some energy for the day and we're gonna keep going. Another thing that I had to keep an eye out for was misshapen and imperfect blocks. A repeating pattern like this is very sensitive to small discrepancies. If one of my blocks was even a 16th too big or too small, it had the potential to knock the entire pattern out of alignment. Now, realistically, when you're working on a project with a thousand individual blocks, some oddballs are bound to sneak their way in there, but I did my absolute best to minimize their impact. All right, that's a big guy done. Let's set him aside. Now, we can do the smaller ones. Oh, and if you hadn't already guessed it from this footage, CA glue was the clear and obvious winner in the glue competition. Its rapid setting time made it a real asset on this build. Whew, all right, that's it, we're done. And if I never see another one of these wood blocks again, it'll be too soon. I am sick and tired of these wood blocks. Oh, that was seriously tedious, but now we're ready to move on to the next step. As much as I would love to jump right into finishing at this point, I think we need to take a little bit of time and sand this whole thing. Let me show you why. I did my absolute best in order to make sure that all of these blocks were the exact same size, but unfortunately, there were some small discrepancies between the pieces, and when you have this many rows and columns, by the time you get to the last row, those discrepancies add up to some pretty significant variations, and there's little bumps along this outside edge. 
So I'm gonna use some rough grit sandpaper, sand this smooth, do all the outside edges, and then maybe clean up some of these rough edges here too. Now this is a great example of something that gets cut out of videos because it's just too boring to watch. All the sanding probably took me about an hour to do total, but in YouTube video time, it took just this long. Ah, don't you love movie magic? And you know what? Before we throw the finish on, let's put these French cleats on. All right, now that we got all that stuff out of the way, we can finally start applying our finish, which is from the sponsor of today's video, Minwax. Today, I'm going to be using their polycrylic finish. Now, I've never actually used this one before, but I've been wanting to try it for a while for a couple of reasons. One, it advertises itself as being extremely fast drying, which is always nice when you're working in the shop. It just means you can get multiple coats on a project that much quicker. And then two, it's water-based. And water-based finishes are inherently easier to work with. It just makes cleaning up at the end of the day that much easier, which is especially important to me on this build because I'm gonna be applying it with a product from the second sponsor from this video, Purdy Brushes. And I am an absolute stickler for keeping my brushes clean at the end of the day. Here's the thing about brushes. People often treat them like they're disposable. They buy the cheap ones, they use them for a bit, and then they throw them away at the end of the job. And the thing about cheap brushes is that they don't apply the finish as well. That's why I have always been a big fan of Purdy brushes. Not only do these apply the finish so nicely, but they're also extremely durable. And that means at the end of the job, you can take them, rinse them out, and save them for another day. So I end up treating paint brushes more as like a tool investment. I know that I'm gonna keep these brushes for many, many years, so I don't mind getting the high quality ones at the store. Today, I'm gonna be using their XL Dale brush in the one inch variant. I'm pretty sure this is the smallest brush that Purdy makes in their entire lineup, but it's gonna be perfect for getting in all of these hard to reach corners, all these tight little alcoves in the pattern. All right, I have a feeling this is gonna take a while, just like gluing all these blocks to the board did. So let's get cracking on applying the finish. While watching this, I'm sure that many of you are asking yourselves why I didn't just spray on this finish. And truth be told, for a competent sprayer, that might've been the way to go. But a competent sprayer, I am not. I'm much better and much more confident with a brush in my hand. I didn't wanna risk messing up a project that I had already invested so many hours that being said though, applying this finish with the brushes was an absolute pleasure. It obviously took a while because of all the nooks and crannies that I had created for myself, but it went on with very minimal brush strokes that quickly leveled themselves out, leaving behind a perfectly even finish. I was also surprised at how little color there was. This is a great finish for preserving the natural tones and character of the wood you're working on. The wood took on a deeper, richer look with very little color shift. And the Dale brushes themselves were great. Anybody who's used a pretty brush knows exactly what I mean. They're easy to control due to their long handles and balanced design. The nylon polyester hybrid bristles are predictable, durable, and work with pretty much every paint, stain, and finish on the market. So you can stock one type of brush for like 99% of your finish work. And again, these brushes are well built and durable. So after I was done, I rinsed them out in warm water and set them aside ready to go for the next job, which actually came quite quickly because between the second and third coats of the polycrylic finish, I also painted these pieces of trim in flat black in preparation for a later step. Alright, I think that is it for the finish. Alright, now that that's done, let's address this little gap that runs the whole way around. When these get mounted on the wall, I don't wanna see these two layers of plywood that serve as the base and the French cleat. So my solution is very simple. I went to the hardware store, I got the simplest trim they had, I painted it black, and now we're gonna mount it on the side here. The install of this black trim was actually really straightforward. I just cut the pieces to length on the miter saw, glued together the mitered corners with more CA glue, and then nailed them in place with my 18 gauge cordless trim nailer. Not only will these trims hide the ugly plywood backer boards, but they'll also function as a frame that will outline these diffusers and call attention to their secondary function as nice looking wall art. All right, I think that's it. We're now ready to take these guys home and install them. Off camera, I touched up all those nail holes, but like I was saying earlier, some things just aren't that interesting to watch on videos. But you know what will be interesting is how we install these back in my office. So let's go take care of that. Oh, this big one is heavy. Mounting this to the wall is gonna be a lot of fun. So here's the issue. I live in a condo and this is an interior partition wall. So there's a 99% chance that that's framed with steel studs, which will make mounting something this heavy a little tricky. Luckily, 
this heavy piece is nice and wide, so I should be able to distribute its weight across at least a couple studs. In order to make sure that my sound diffusion panels didn't go in all cockeyed, I set up my laser level and use that as a guide to install the French cleats. And then from there, I used a combination of painter's tape and my keen detective skills to locate some studs to bear the weight of the big heavy panel. To help spread the weight, I used these metal drywall anchors for each screw. Not only for the screws that went into the drywall, but also for the screws that landed on the steel studs as well. With the cleats in place, there was nothing left to do but lift the new sound diffusion panels into place, stand back, and enjoy the view. Okay, so time for the real test. Have these panels completely eliminated all the reverb in this room? Well, no, probably not, but they should help. And I also think they look really cool. And actually, you know what? You guys will probably be the best judges of whether or not these panels work because I will be recording all the voiceovers for this video here in the office with the panel set up. So just let me know down in the comments if this video sounds any better than any of my previous videos. Frankly speaking, even if these were just wall art, I would still be happy with the way they turned out. But the way I see it is they're part of a much larger solution. I've actually got another build coming up where I'm gonna make some more sound traps for this room. So you might wanna get subscribed so you don't miss that. And maybe my favorite part about these panels is the fact that they've given me a new camera angle to work with. I used to always avoid shooting against this wall because well, it's just a big white wall and it was super boring to look at, but now, it it looks a little bit more interesting. So at the end of the day, I've picked up a new camera angle to work with, some sound diffusion, and some cool wall art. Not bad considering I did it all with a bunch of scrap wood that I had laying around the shop. And that seems like a good a spot as any to end this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video and you'd like to support the channel, hit the like button, leave a comment, and subscribe if you aren't already. I'd really appreciate it. Additionally, there's all sorts of links in the video description, all of which help the channel in some way. Big thank you to Purdy and Minwax for sponsoring this video, and an especially big thank you to all my Patreon supporters. You guys sponsor everything I do, and I really appreciate it. That's it for me, and I will see you in the next video. Peace.